Hello, everyone, and welcome to this live broadcast and new episode of interactive webinar series additive by Sandvik, Material Matters. My name is Paulina Schelin, and I will be your host throughout this session, focusing on the groundbreaking news presented by Sandvik and part subsidiary Beamit earlier this spring, namely the ability of using super duplex stainless steel in additive manufacturing. For those of you joining us for the first time today, I would also like to present my colleague joining me here on stage today. We have promised you an interactive webinar and here to make sure that is what you get is my colleague, Dr. Peter Harlin. Hi, Peter. Hi, Paulina. Doesn't it feel good being back in the limelight with me? Really nice. <laughs> so good. And also so good to see that so many people have joined us. And uh, today uh, we also have, uh, as last time, pre-registered -re questions uh, that uh, we will pick up during uh, uh, the first part uh, of this uh, episode. And then at the end, we will have uh, submitted questions uh, that you can submit live now. And uh, I encourage you to do this because uh, then you have a good possibility to get your question uh, brought up at the end. Then. And new also for this episode is that after this uh, one hour, uh, our experts will be chatting live during one hour and answering your questions related to today's topic then. So uh, more on this later on then. So. Yes, and speaking of those experts, you uh, better believe we have a nice lineup for you today. So apart from our own experts in metal powders and additive manufacturing, we are joined by Martina Riccio, who is the R&D manager of the Beamit Group, uh, the world's largest independent AM service provider. We have Fami Al-Shawa, who is the CEO of Imensa Additive Manufacturing Group, the MENA region's uh, leading uh, AM solution provider. And finally, we have Gisle Rörvik, who is a materials advisor with offshore energy giant Equinor. But first thing is first, and today is all about the potential and impact of superduplex stainless steel and 3D printing. And when it comes to superduplex, we actually happen to have one of the definite duplex rock stars being part of our crew. Apart from that, he is an awarded materials expert with several innovations of great importance on his resume. And he is also the head of technology at Sanvik Additive Manufacturing. Here to start us off on the right foot is Pasi Kangas. How about that introduction, Pasi? Are you feeling the pressure? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, Paulina. Thank you. I don't think I'm a rock star, but I love duplex stainless steels. So I will, this seminar will be about duplex stainless steels. And, uh, these materials have been around for decades, and uh, the original thing with this was to save on nickel. Uh, but the, the duplex means twofold, and it relates to the microstructure of the materials, and uh, it uh, combines strength and corrosion resistance in a, in a good way, and it has been used for marine applications for a long time. In the early 90s, we developed the super duplex at, at Sandvik. When I was a young engineer at Sandvik, we started this development. And this material has excellent corrosion resistance in seawater and, uh, and with good strength as well. So, later on, we have developed uh, other materials like Sufferex for urea applications. Uh, and uh, later on, the hyper duplex that is used when even the super duplex are uh, not suitable. And now, lately, the the Osprey 2507, which is a material that's used for additive manufacturing. So one of the most uh, important applications for, for duplex so far is for steel tube umbilicals that used 1,000 meters below the seabed in connecting uh, oil wells with a mother platform. And that's really uh, demanding environment with seawater corrosion, uh, dynamic loads and uh, high pressure. So it's a really demanding environment and we have been using this material for three decades now. Uh, then when it comes to, to additive manufacturing, there are many advantages with ad additive manufacturing. You can produce complex shapes, you can uh, have a fast production, you can have a delivery in a very short time, uh, you can reduce your inventory and, and you can uh, have a very uh, flexible way of production. So at Sandvik we have uh, 
been optimizing Osprey 2507 for additive manufacturing, reaching as good or better properties compared to conventionally produced superduplex. Um, it has uh, all these benefits and knowledge about the material has of course been the key to reach these, uh, these properties. The chemistry, the printing, the heat treatment and so on. So at Sandvik Additive Manufacturing we have the widest material program, program for additive manufacturing. Um, leading capabilities across the value chain which means that we are, we are talking about pr planet printed perfected. It's not only the printing, it's the raw material, it's all the steps until you have a finished product that are important. And uh, we have been the first to print superduplex, exemplified by this impeller that we're showing here. Um, we are, since we have the complete value chain, we can control the quality of all the steps and lock it into to something that will work. And, and this impeller meets or exceeds the properties uh, uh, of uh, super duplex materials. It's available for customers where you have uh, demanding environments like seawater, any corrosive chemicals uh, or high loads. And since we sell the whole value chain you can rel rely on a quality that is reproducible and, and uh, uh, is part of the, uh, the offering from Sandvik. But with that I would like to leave the word to the experts to explain further what we have done. Thank you. Thank you, Pasi. Uh, I don't know about you, but after that, I'm feeling more than ready to get this show on the road. And I think it's high time we welcome our two first experts up on the screen. So please join me in welcoming Johan Wallin, who is a product manager for Superduplex, and Nikhil Dixit, who's an AM application engineer with Sandvik Additive Manufacturing. Good to see you guys. Thanks for joining. Are you ready to share some material insights with us? Hi, Paulina. Well, thank you. Yes, we are. And I agree with Pasi that Sandvik has to supply this material for the offshore energy sector for more than 50 years. So it's just about time that we also start to do this with additive manufacturing. So me and my colleague Nikhil, we will start to tell you a little bit about the material and the raw material, the metal powder to start with. So I'll uh, give the word to Nikhil to explain a little bit more details about that. Thank you, Paulina, and thank you, Juan. Indeed, the selecting the best pit stock will result in superior printer outcome as well. Uh, so that's why our Osprey 2507 is Vega Automized Powder with the best possible control over the quality and the chemical elements as well. We get perfectly round particles with optimum phase and microstructure balance as shown in the same images as well. As previously communicated, super duplex stainless steel, especially this 2507, is, is used when the part is subjected to high mechanical loads along with the chloride environment due to its superior mechanical and corrosion properties. On the next slide, you can see that the powder automized can be available in various fractions as, uh, as in the chart. Depending on the application process, the particle size distribution varies. For example, in binder jetting, metal injection molding, laser powder bed fusion process, electron beam powder bed fusion process, and of course, direct energy deposition and heat process as well. In this particular development work, uh, we have used laser powder bed fusion and the fraction for this powder was 15 to 53 micron. And we have developed this on our EOS M290 equipment. Yeah, that sounds great, Nikhil. I mean, with quality powder, you will get quality printed products. Now, when you have used the powder and printed these components, could you tell us a little bit more about what kind of properties you will get with these components? Yes, of course. Like. Uh, before starting with the properties, I, I can start with the basics of this material as well. So once this part is printed, we inspect the components if we can see any visible cracks and perform the density measurement test as well. In order to achieve the full density and crack-free parts, we started with various design of experiments uh, with the various processing parameters. There are plenty of parameters to consider while optimizing this uh, region. So for example, based on optics, then the gas environment, design and geometry of the parts and so on. Overall, there are typically three regions in the relative density versus laser energy input plot. Firstly, lack of fusion region where we have very much less energy to melt the material completely and hence we end up seeing defects in the material due to insufficient energy. Then in the middle, 
uh, it's fully dense region where the parameters are in the optimized stage and are ideal to use. The last keyhole region is where we see again some porosity in the parts due to excessive energy. Uh, and that's due to the melt pool dynamics happening in the bed. And now I'm very happy to tell you that we have achieved full dense parts in the as built condition without any cracks and with 99.90 plus relative density in the printed components. That is great achievement, Nikhil. I mean, crack free, free and fully dense parts, that's, that's step one towards the goal for the complete uh, qualified end product. But equally important of this material is the uh, microstructure. As you can see in this um, picture here, we have a picture of the microstructure of a duplex deals. There are many types of, of different duplex deals, ranging from lean duplex to hyper duplex, as Pasi said. And one of the main differences here are the chemical co composition, and mainly then by chromium, nickel, and molybdenum. The higher alloy elements of these three, the better corrosive and mechanical properties you will get. And the microstructure here is the key. It's a 50% austenite 50% ferrite balance in this matrix. You have a matrix of blue ferrite with islands of red austenite in it. And this is what makes this steel so superior. It has the mechanical strength from the ferrite combined with the corrosive properties from austenite combined to a super material. And if you can elaborate a little bit more about these uh, mechanical properties, Nikhil, of the duplex steel. Yeah, you want. And as you said, this phase balance is equally important to achieve this mechanical properties and also the corrosion properties. First, I'll go through the material properties in terms of mechanical properties of our Osprey 25.7 uh, produced using additive manufacturing process. As we can see in the graph, the material shows the superior mechanical performance with tensile and impact properties. If you consider the left side of the graph, the tensile properties of material indicated by ultimate tensile strength and importantly, the yield strength. This represent is presented at various temperatures ranging from 20 degrees to 300 degrees Celsius. Typically with the conservative approach, the service temperature of this material can be up to 300 degrees Celsius. The tensile properties at room temperature show that the yield strength, the important one, is well above 600 megapascal, outperforming conventionally manufactured tubes, bars, and well above the standard, which states 550 megapascal is the minimum requirement of this material. On the other hand, the impact properties are crucial as well as at the room temperature and sub-zero temperature, as it is the most relevant for the offshore and service environments. At room temperature, the impact energy is almost about 250 Joule, outperforming the conventionally manufactured super duplex stainless steel. Moreover, at minus 46 degrees Celsius, the standard says it's required to have at least 45, 45 joule of energy as a safety limit, but additively manufactured OSPET 2507 shows values well within the range of 200 joule, indicating that AIM components are safe to use with proper process control, Yuan. That's very interesting, Nikhil. I mean, we have seen that this additively manufactured super duplex has improved mechanical properties. But I also know that this super duplex material made by additive manufacturing also has very good corrosive resistance. And normally a super duplex material uh, can resist chlorides and thereby seawater in a very good manner. And if you look at these mechanical properties at elevated temperatures, I guess that this material can also be very suitable for warmer climates against corrosion, such as the Middle East, Gulf of Mexico, Asia, South America, etc. So I guess it's even better to use uh, for the offshore sector uh, with this material. Absolutely. Uh, the comparative graph here in the slide shows how our Osprey 257 outperforms and also fulfills all the standard data when subjected to standard corrosion G48 test. We have achieved critical pitting temperature of around 90 degrees Celsius for the bulk and also as printed and processed surface as well. This shows that the material is not only mechanically strong, but it also possesses the required corrosion performance in the service conditions as well. Also, with another test, G150 test, conducted in the salt solution, indicates that higher CP CPT values with more than 95 degrees Celsius, outperforming the available forms of all the conventional process materials. And now, I, I guess we can talk 
about these properties and corrosion more, but I guess at the moment we can stop you on and maybe take some questions later on. So I hand over to Paulina. Thank you, uh, Nikki, and, and thank you, Yuan. Always a, a pleasure to hear from you. And on this note, uh, Peter, to no one's surprise, I know that there's been quite some interest among the pre-registered questions related to the corrosion properties, right? Yes, uh, there sure is. And um, for sure, we, we take one uh, from the viewers. Um, uh, and um, uh, this relates to corrosion properties uh, and also about the phase balance there. Uh, it was mentioned earlier by you one there that uh, you aim to have a, a phase balance of 50-50 percent then of uh, austenite and ferrite. But how is it? If it is it difficult to achieve this in the end uh, product if you use additive manufacturing? Uh, what do you say? Well, uh, it's all about the heat treatment. Uh, to summarize it shortly, heat treatment and cooling rate, because when you build a component with super duplex or duplex, you will have 96, 98% ferrite as built. So you need to heat treat it. You, heat, you need to elevate the temperature up to 1100 degrees approximately. And then you have to have a special cooling rate. So you cool it at the right time and temperature to obtain this ferrite austenite structure and phase balance. And also to avoid unnecessary phases or unwanted phases like the sigma phases, etc. So you need to know what you're doing. You need to have the material knowledge as we have to obtain this 50-50% ferrite austenite. And below around 600 degrees Celsius, uh, the microstructure is stable. So it won't change, uh, at, for example, at room temperature. So that's the key, the cooling rate and heat treatment. Oh. Interesting. And you mentioned this about sigma phase. I mean, one gets curious. What, what happens? <laughs> I mean, uh, sigma sounds good, or? <laughs> no, it's not. It's a detrimental phase that you absolutely want to avoid in duplex stainless steels. Ah, okay. <laughs> uh, I guess that we could dig even deeper into this subject uh, yeah. uh, right now. But uh, we have the agenda, and I turn to Paulina then and ask, what, what is next now? Well, thank you. Uh, it, it, is, it is actually time to move on toward our second segment, uh, going into the, the process focus and the actual printing of super duplex stainless steels. And, and here to walk us through this, I would like, like to welcome Nikhil back up on the screen again, and also welcome uh, another expert and part Part of the Sanvik Additive family to the show. Uh, Martina, you are the R&D manager of the Beamit Group and we are so happy to have you. Hello everybody, thank you Paulina for giving me the script. I want to start giving you an introduction of the Beamit Group. It is based in Cornovo di Taro, Italy and has been more uh, than 25 years of experience in additive manufacturing. Since July 2019, Sanvik has acquired a significant stake from Beamit and a huge collaboration, as you can and will see, has started. Then Limit also started the collaboration with Prefix and acquired Zare and Trikia additive manufacturing, thus joining the force of the three major service additive manufacturing bureaus of Europe, together with Sandvik additive manufacturing, a largest provider of solution for IM has, uh, has been established in order to serve the most demanding industries. That sounds interesting, Martina. Could you please elaborate more about the BMIT capabilities and the processing portfolios? Sure, Nikhil. Today, BMIT has five facilities in Italy and one in the UK, and commercial offices spread all over the world. It has more than 59 additive manufacturing systems. Most of them are laser powder bed fusion, both for metals and polymers. It Thus, it covers the core wall supply chain, starting from the design up to the part finishing, passing by AM, equipment, and machining, of course. It has the widest portfolio of metal alloys qualified for uh, AM, and some of them are still on R&D, since we are uh, developing always new alloys, and the super duplex is one of them. That sounds really interesting. And I can see that there is duplex and super duplex material in the portfolio that we are developing all together as well. And of course, it is widely used in the oil and gas industry. And of course, the industry demands quite a lot of standards and qualification methods as well. So Martina, do, are we working in some kind of standards as well? Yes, Nikhil. Oil and gas is a sector in which we see a great potentiality for IAM. So uh, in parallel to material development, we are also working 
uh, in order to leverage the additive manufacturing participating to the API 20F standard, the API standard for metal IEM part and product qualification. For the last year and a half, I've been joining uh, the API uh, 20F task group in which experts coming from all over the world meet together in order to write the first edition of this standard that will be published by the end of the year. In the meanwhile, we are working on uh, materials. Today is some material day, so let's speak about uh, super duplex nickel. Can you tell us a little bit more on how we process it? Yes, absolutely. I can tell you more about this entire value chain of additive manufacturing. And of course, firstly, it starts with the powder. So uh, at Sandvik, we use the vacuum induction melting inert gas optimization process to produce our powders, especially super alloys and steels. We have optimized our Osprey 2507 using the same technology. This process of melting under vacuum or using protective atmosphere uh, ensures high quality grade metal powders, which typically results in spherical shape, high cleanliness, and also the optimum yield. Once these powders are optimized, they are blended together to ensure the homogenization of the powder, and they are packed into the containers with specific uh, information on the label, such as manufacturing records and certificates. When this powder is then checked for quality, at various tests are performed to ensure the powder properties. Finally, the powder is delivered using material data sheet and safety data sheets as well. We also ensure the sustainability aspect by several means such as uh, like utilizing the excess heat during the for the in-house heating electric heating for high efficiency and also waste material remelting and etc once uh, this powder has been optimized then we move on to the next slide where this uh, then we see the actually additive manufacturing process overall in the flow diagram so with suitable powder bed fusion process, we start manufacturing or actually printing this component out of this metal powder. In this case, we use laser powder bed fusion process to produce parts. As you can see in the next slide with the video where powder layer is being spread and on the build pack form, a roller or recorder is then spreads the powder and then the CAD model is actually tracing the laser melting. Again, the process repeats itself and the part is produced layer by layer, and hence it is known as additive manufacturing. In printing of Osprey 257, we need to ensure adequate post processing as well, as mentioned earlier by Yuan uh, as well. We have developed our process parameters based on our EOS M290 equipment in San Vigan, but also we have started this qualification with our strategic partner, BMA. Oh, this is very interesting, Nikhil. Can you tell us a little bit more about our joint qualification work as well? Yes, of course. This transfer of parameter was not only the step, but we also ensured the build process qualification protocol, including post-processing and quality systems as well. In both of the cases, in terms of part relative densities, we observed 99.97% plus uh, mean values with very minimum standard deviation all over the build plate. The microstructures were also studied and found to have identical results with 50-50% of ferrite and austenite phase in the material. Apart from this, various properties like uh, hardness, tensile, and impact have also been studied and compared, and they, it has found that they are equivalent at both the sites. Now, as we move forward uh, in the uh, upcoming days, we will hear more about the upcoming work that we have performed on our uh, higher build volume printers as well. And uh, as it was highlighted earlier as well by Pasi and Yuan, heat treatment is most crucial step. Uh, but Martina, can you please elaborate more about the capabilities at BMIT as well? Yes, exactly, Nikhil. The treatment is a crucial step uh, in order to achieve the right of the night for the right microstructure. In particular, the cooling rate and the process condition have to be controlled in order to achieve this result. VMIT has a state-of-the-art treatment facility that has been NATCAP accredited in 2019. We successfully tested and validated the solution equipment for our super duplex, uh, achieving the correct microstructure and preventing any type of defect that can occur when this phase is not performed properly. But lastly, uh, if you move with the uh, next slide, we can see that Sandvik and BMIT know that 
super oil and gas uh, needs with super duplex are of big size component. That's why the qualification of our Earth 2507 on the EOS and 219 has been, has, uh, has been only the first step. We are currently finalizing the process parameters transfer, uh, material characterization and validation of our super duplex in our biggest machine, the EOS and 400 and the concept laser it's like 2000. So if some of you have this kind of uh, specific dimensional needs, we will be happy to further discuss and provide you more information. Thank you all. I hope now you have a better understanding of what we offer. So I'll give back the word to Paulina. Thanks again. Thank you so much, Martina, and thank you, Nikhil, as well. I think it is safe to say that uh, there's a lot more coming from Sanvik and Beam when it comes to printing in super duplex stainless steel. And if we return to our pre-registered questions, they also reflect a huge interest in the continued development of this, right, Peter? Yes, indeed they do. And uh, especially there is one topic now uh, that is related to design and also building in additive manufacturing processes then. And uh, this one goes to Martina then, and uh, it's related to uh, the size of the build chamber uh, when moving from a smaller machine into a larger machine that you are about to do now. Do you see any challenges uh, when it comes to building 2507 then? Yes, sure, Peter. Of course, uh, when it comes to when we move to small machine to the big machine, the designer has to take into account all the constraints related to the part dimension. But uh, when we uh, refer to material properties, uh, since previous experience, we are confident that the material properties are, uh, are machine size independent. So no problem at all. Uh. No problems. I like that answer. Sounds really good. And it brings hope for the future in implementing AM. Um, so I turn to uh, Paulina. What is next? Well, uh, I know that we also have another question in there uh, with a viewer wondering about the main barriers for the offshore industry to inc incorporate AM parts into critical well control applications. And when it comes to this, I thought it is such a convenient fit for our next presenter. So I would actually like to take this opportunity to welcome Fami Al Shawa to the screen. Uh, hi, Fami. Uh, before embarking on your presentation, would you mind helping me out in answering this? What are the main barriers when it comes to implementing AM in the offshore segment? Uh, I think over the last couple of years, the biggest barrier was awareness and standardization. And we're so slowly seeing uh, industry uh, overcoming this, and we're seeing new standards come up by the NP, API, and so on. So I think the standards are being chipped at slowly. Thank you, Fami. Well, please proceed. We are all ears to what you have to share with us. Thank you. So, uh, as I mentioned, we're a Dubai-based company and we have presence across the Middle East region and some operations in North America. We focus on the entire spectrum of additive manufacturing from uh, design, material qualification, uh, all the way to actual manufacturing using AM. We currently have three facilities in the GCC. We have offices in the US, we have partners across Europe, and we focus primarily on oil and gas. What we do for oil and gas on the next slide you'll see is what we call digital inventory, which is effectively producing spare parts on demand. Our focus is the oil and gas and petroleum industry. And what we do is take physical parts, dissect it, reverse engineer it, and then restore it virtually and produce it using AM. Why do companies do this? Faster lead time, uh, lower cost of sourcing, of procurement, and lower carbon footprint. Uh, the, what we've said in the next slide, uh, you'll see that the biggest value is the lead time and the cost for spare parts. Uh, they, the potential is massive, and there's all companies look at our solution where they can reduce how much inventory they can hold and how they can make the supply chain more efficient. So, an average company that holds around four to five hundred million dollars worth of spare parts, which is typical in the oil and gas industry will be able to save over $100 million by being able to 3D print the parts instead of stocking them in a conventional method. What's uh, interesting in our relationship with Sandvik comes here where we look at this as a $160 billion opportunity. There is that much spare parts that are uh, spent. That's the spent on spare parts annually. Uh, the biggest obstacle beyond the standards and guidelines was actually the availability of materials. And this is a key, a key and critical vital 
um, factor in actually the adoption of the technology. Software development has been very advanced. Uh, the machines have been very, quite advanced and we're seeing with the expi expiring patents, we're seeing more advanced machines coming in. But our biggest challenge has been till today, we cannot really digitize and 3D print more than two to 3% of the parts available because of the limitation of materials where we had probably six to 10 materials that were qualified. And oil and gas, we need advanced materials. We need uh, materials such, and this is uh, one of the most interesting things what Sandvik done with Osprey and super duplex stainless steels, where you expand the universe of parts. As this expands today, probably almost 30 to 40 percent can be can qualify for AM based on material. And as that uh, world of or universe of materials expands, we can see more and more parts actually qualify for 3D printing, which moves us, uh, changes the entire industry structure into a more carbon uh, environment friendly uh, uh, supply chain. So we're excited about the future. We're very excited about what Sandvik has been doing. Uh, our partnership with them has really opened up uh, the potential. And we see a lot of the national oil companies in the region adopting AM thanks to the uh, availability of these advanced metals. Thank you. Thank you, Fami. Uh, very interesting indeed to hear more about the, the potential of this uh, technology across such a challenging industry. Uh, but now uh, you have been served with quite a bit of information from perhaps a slightly similar perspective of things. So to change it up a little bit and provide you with an even more extensive picture, we have also invited an end user and actually our partner in creating the Impeller Reinvented. Here to represent uh, offshore energy giant Equinoris, Gisle Rörvik. Hi uh, Gisle, how have you uh, enjoyed the webinar this far? Hi uh, Paulina, I have for sure enjoyed the webinar and the insights so far. I would like to give a brief presentation of Equinor as an end user. So uh, we are a broad energy company with uh, 20,000 employees and is present in more than 30 countries worldwide. And we are uh, mainly developing oil, gas, wind and solar energy. And on the next slide, we will see our uh, global presence uh, as well as uh, some key key numbers. It's also worth mentioning that we are going more and more into a new en energy sector and is today also providing energy to more than one million uh, homes, uh, especially in uh, UK. Okay, maybe I should uh, say something about the importance and benefits of 3D printed components. As an end user, we are realizing the cost benefits and the future potential of uh, AM and 3D printing, both in terms of replacement or repair of obsolete parts, the reduced lead and downtimes, optimized function and performance of new parts, the reduced environmental uh, footprint, as well as the gradual reduction of our physical inventory and the establishment of a digital supply chain and inventory, like uh, also was uh, touched upon by uh, FAMI from uh, Imensa. Furthermore, on the next slide, uh, also say that to take out the full potential and get confidence of AM 3D printing, it is also necessary to establish test inspection and QA, QSA protocols for qualification, certification and production, along with the continuous development and research activities to establish AM process property relationships for different methods, materials and applications. And here is shown the DNV standard that was uh, developed uh, during 2018 to 2020 and published in May 2020. And uh, that complements also what is going on with the API 20S standard that will soon be published this year, like touched upon by uh, Martina. Okay, then uh, we'll say something about the super duplex and its uh, importance. Uh, Equinor actually started already in 2017 to investigate the development of laser powder bed fusion of superduplex stainless steels due to its very widespread use in our industry. And it's in especially in our top side uh, process systems. And it's because of the high strength combined with the adequate corrosion resistance in the uh, marine atmosphere and uh, seawater service. So I think we uh, also have uh, some results when we did the early, <laughs> early um, research on it. And like also mentioned by uh, Johan and Nikhil, the challenge is really the 
as built state to avoid cracking and uh, as you see here it's very high strength and very low ductility in the as built uh, state so if you can can um, uh, get rid of any cracks in that stage then you can heat treat it and achieve the correct uh, osnite uh, ferrite uh, balance typically around 50-50 and uh, we also shown uh, already then that uh, it was achievable by several different uh, uh, solution annealing uh, uh, heat treatment uh, procedures. Okay, uh, we could go to the next slide and, and um, what we also had done together with um, Sandvik uh, recently is a successful build qualification that was finalized with uh, Sandvik following the, the recently published DNVSDB203 standard. And we saw excellent uh, mechanical properties as well as uh, corrosion properties like demonstrated earlier in the webinar. And as a final example uh, about the importance of superduplex, the recent Johan Sveidrup field development utilized as much as 3,000 500 tons of duplex and superduplex stainless steels and only in the topside process piping system to ensure weight savings and robustness over the entire design life of uh, 50 years. I think that's uh, all from uh, me. Back to you, Paulina. Thank you, Gisle. Uh, well, uh, guys, this has already been quite a jam-packed session, but we do have qu a few more minutes to go. And like we did last time, we have made sure to save the best for last. So uh, I'd say it's time to get all of our experts up on our screen and welcome Pasi back to the studio. And then, um, Peter, are you ready to get this Q&A on the road? I sure am. I know we have quite a yeah, bit yeah, to go yeah, through, yeah. so we no got, time uh, like the present. Yeah. Uh, we got a lot of questions and also, again, uh, if you have questions when you listen to when we speak, so send them in, bring them on, and uh, hopefully we can, let's say, organize them together. Uh, the first question then is to uh, Gisle, uh, and it's uh, related to uh, the area of um, qualification uh, that you mentioned. And um, I mean, it is uh, extensive quality control to get into oil and gas. Uh, but um, uh, is it, let's say, more extensive quality control needed for AM materials uh, as compared to conventionally made materials today? Uh, well, uh, Peter, since AM comprised several quite new technologies to our industry, it would in some years to come uh, be reasonable, I think, to be uh, slightly careful and do some more uh, extensive QA, QC activities and testing to gain confidence and experience, and especially for the more uh, critical uh, applications. Mm. Oh, it's interesting, and it's also, I, I, I cannot, uh, let's say, uh, help them to uh, ask um, uh, FAMI uh, a similar question then. I mean, uh, implementing additive manufacturing, uh, do you think that, uh, I mean, you need today to already to have the quality controls in place, or do you have such a, let's say, internal control uh, on your processes, so, so it's, uh, let's say, possible uh, to uh, supply uh, your service in a good way then? Uh, I, I think it's critical, uh, first thing, to build the confidence. So initially, we do have our internal QC, which is extensive, and we invest quite a bit to ensure that the parts coming out uh, meet all the ASTM standards and so on. In addition, we do use third-party qualification centers, so it's very important. And it's, I think it's more than what the technology can do. It's really getting the comfort level of the end users. So uh, I think that's uh, why we sort of... If in a conventional way we do one level of testing and uh, references, in AM we do three of them just to ensure that we we, we over uh, emphasize uh, the quality. So definitely we do. You have to do that, especially yeah. with the new technology and new adoption. It sounds very reassuring then, I must say. Uh, and then uh, we got another question. And um, this is a little bit, uh, I mean, more in, let's say, higher resolution. Uh, question and it's related to something called austenite spacing. Uh, that is the let's say uh, 
the distance then between the austenite islands that you can have uh, in the microstructure. Uh, so you have, as mentioned earlier, both austenite and ferrite then. And uh, I turned to Parsi then uh, and asked them, because uh, first uh, part of the question is related to how large is it? I mean, we see in the microstructures here uh, on the presentation uh, made earlier by Nikhil and Yuan there. Uh, and um, you could see the, the uh, red and blue colors there, uh, so it looked really nice then. Uh, that is the first part. Is it, anyth is it possible to say anything about the, the size? And also, uh, could this be relate related to any, let's say, critical properties of the end properties? And uh, this question is related to hydrogen-induced stress cracking and also stress corrosion cracking. Well, that's a very deep question. I, I think austenite spacing is uh, uh, a way of uh, describing the microstructure and, and the distance between the different phases in the material. It's not really the grain size, but it's something that we use to describe how fine grain structure it is. And typically I would say that this type of material has around 10 to 20 microns, micrometer distance between the austenite. And it's, if it's a larger structure like a bar, it could be 50 to 100 micrometers, but that's typical. So it's really fine-grained anyway compared to other materials. And when it comes to properties, I mean, phase balance is important. Uh, if you have too much of ferrite, you can run into risk of uh, uh, things like hydrogen-induced stress cracking. But in this case, you have a proper phase balance and you have this austenite that is blocking the, the, the some of these, these uh, things that could happen in the material. Mm. We can talk a lot about this. Uh, an hour you can talk about this phenomenon. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can imagine, <laughs> and it's a really an interesting topic. Uh, but uh, yeah, again, we have a, a let's say quite restricted amount of time also, uh, and uh, I mean also we, we got one question that is more process related then. Uh, so uh, I turn to uh, uh, Nikhil then that has worked with, with the let's say heat treatment there. Um, you showed a lot uh, about heat treatment and. Uh, uh, there were many also of the experts talking about the importance of heat treatment, but um, is it possible to say, let's say, anything more than, I mean, you one talked about avoiding the sigma phase and so, but what about atmosphere? I mean, should you use a hot isostatic press or should you have any, let's say, uh, uh, other shielding atmosphere if you use an ordinary furnace or is it possible to comment on this? Yes. Uh Yes, brother, definitely. Like the, there are different ways that you can heat treat this material, and also uh, Isla also um, mentioned about this regarding the solution annealing of this material along with U1 as well, where we mentioned about this 50-50 percent of this ferrite and austenite is crucial, and it all depends on the solution annealing temperature at which you heat treat the material. Also, as you mentioned, the gas environment, is it argon, nitrogen, or should it be vacuum? So that also has several effects on the external surfaces of these components, which might end up with oxide scalings and whatnot. And then again, if you have the porosity in the material, uh, luckily we did not have much porosity in the material as well, and as our process was almost steady and robust, so, but if you have the pro, like porosity, then of course, hipping is one of the ways to eliminate this porosity. But again, uh, you need to be very sure about the cooling rates of this uh, material, as you one also mentioned about like if you are well above within the limits of the cooling rate until 300 degrees Celsius, then it's possible to get rid of the sigma phase. Otherwise, you get a lot of sigma phase in the material, and then uh, sigma phase. Maybe the name is fancy, but then. Uh, it's detrimental to the corrosion properties of the material. So in short, yes, uh, it's possible to do several trials with several heat treatment atmospheres, temperatures, cooling rates, and also different treatments as well. Okay, but I mean, it sounds, uh, if you would like to fine tune your properties then uh, of the end product, you have uh, somewhat the possibility to do that also. It's not like a single solution. Uh, it's uh, also a little bit dependent on the, let's say, fine tuning to the end properties then uh, that you desire. Uh, the next question, um, it, it is about uh, processing and process, uh, processing in additive manufacturing and uh, laser powder bed fusion machines then. So I turn to Martina then. 
uh, when you build them, uh, I could say both in small or, or large machines then, uh, do you use some sort of a melt pool monitoring uh, or, or is, let's say a similar system to let's say ensure quality and so during printing? Okay, yes, good question. <laughs> this is something that can be implemented in the additive manufacturing and for sure it is a kind of online monitoring technique that can allow you to control the quality of the part uh, during the printing itself. And with this technique you can uh, avoid, maybe in the future, uh, extra uh, quality control like CT scan. Uh, but I think that today this kind of uh, monitoring technique are still uh, under development and they are still not uh, really uh, ready for the serial production. So we really need to implement it and to develop in order to, to let them be uh, useful for the quality control and quality stability of the process. But this is something for sure very interesting and that we are looking for, of course. Yeah, it sounds there is uh, room also for development uh, related to the process equipment then in, in the additive manufacturing machines. Uh, and then uh, I have one question and uh, this one goes for Johan then. Because, I mean, uh, when building parts, uh, you need to have, let's say, properties, interior also. But some, some places and some surfaces, you need to have a smooth surface. Uh, and uh, this question is related then to machining. So uh, mm. when you produce this uh, AM uh, um, 2507 material then, uh, was it any challenging with, uh, for example, milling or, or uh, let's say some sort of a cutting operation that you made? Uh, no, not in particular. I mean, if you need tolerances, really tight tolerances, you need to machine it afterwards. But then it's it's up to the end users to come with their demands and their criteria on what kind of surfaces and tolerances they want. And that, of course, uh, will be discussed before uh, starting any printing. But uh, in general, no, it's a duplex, super duplex material, so it, it uh, you can machine it normally. Yeah. Uh, mm. And uh, I mean, you, can you use the yeah the same uh, settings then as uh, conventional uh, uh, machining of conventional material then? So because then it uh, yeah, sounds I'm, really promising. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm not a machine expert of machining and so on, but uh, what we've heard and seen, we have no problems with machining it with just standard parameters. Yeah, uh, that's really, really good. Uh, good to hear. And um, uh, thank you for that. Uh, I we have many questions here, so I. We'll take one to uh, uh, Gisle, uh, and uh, that is related to uh, uh, a little bit on the topic that has been put today, uh, let's say on the table, but let's say more precise than, uh, uh, let's see, maybe, maybe it's a little bit too precise, but still, uh, one talk about how much time it will take for AM production to match with the near existing materials today. But I mean, what we've seen so far, it matches pretty well. Uh, so so uh, material wise and material property wise, what, what, what would you say, Gisle? I mean, looking at the bulk material properties, are we there today? Or is it any more no, challenging, no. so to say? Actually, uh, I think uh, the properties demonstrated here are, uh, are even better than some of the conventional duplex materials with uh, more coarser grains and coarser uh, 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 osnite ferrite structure. And what I think is uh, also a very promising here is, is the morphology of the osnite because it envelopes the ferrite. Mm. It's not the open ferrite structure. And that will matter, I think, both in terms of HISC performance and also in sour service applications. Oh, it sounds really uh, promising. And is it possible to develop a little bit uh, related to this, uh, to the uh, HISC performance with the hydrogen uh, going into the material? Uh, I mean, where, where, where does that typically end up and how does this uh, austenite uh, placing help? I think the, it's grain boundary austenite and also uh, intragranular austenite, but it's enveloping it. Yeah. If you have a sufficient amount of... Uh, was not an envelope, enveloped uh, ferrite, so we will slow down diffusion because diffusion of hydrogen uh, is going very much slower in 
in the um, OS night, so it meets barriers. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that sounds very promising then, so uh, we'll see. Uh, because I, I guess, uh, I don't know if uh, if you can tell anything, but if, uh, let's say, Equinor are looking into studies on, on this today, or, or how it looks like. No, I think we will do some student works already this autumn uh, on materials uh, uh, made by uh, Sandvik. Yeah. 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 Great. Uh, and um, then we have uh, one question then that has been... Uh, dropped here. It's to Fami, and I mean, I mean, you have an impressive setup there, and uh, uh, this is a let's say a question related to the size. Uh, I mean, similar to to uh, let's say Martina's uh, uh, challenge there with, with going from a small to a large machine that looked quite easy, but. What about small and large parts? Uh, I mean, uh, is it any difference in, in ordering a uh, number of large parts or, or lo number of small parts? Or do you think need to think about that? Or how is it? Uh, I mean, it's, uh, it ends up being about the limitation of the technology. So if we're looking at powder bed fusion, it's always going to be smaller in size. So you're looking at less than uh, one meter. When it goes beyond that, we usually work with partners who are more equipped with one technology. I think that would be probably the biggest limitation in terms of size. Uh, a lot in terms of the reverse engineering and the material that won't, we haven't really seen a big difference. But again, going back, our sweet spot or uh, where AM really falls is anything within a one uh, meter, half a meter to one meter usually. Most of the stuff we look at are smaller impellers, uh, valve components and so on. Oh. Okay, but it sounds like interesting. And I mean, working with this then must be a uh, also quite interesting because I mean you, you you get to see a lot of different designs and also assist with this and to optimize mm? which is the beauty of AM yeah I mean this is the beauty of AM where we don't have to be limited with certain uh, sizes uh, quantities or uh, geometries yeah and the more challenging it is the more exciting I think for all of us yeah. for sure uh, okay so then uh, back to you one then uh, and um, when it comes to, uh, uh, the, uh, let's say, uh, introduction of AM and implementation on the market, uh, what, what do you see as, as uh, the most significant difficulty, uh, difficulty in getting new customers to see additive as an option? Um, I, I think the quality assurance around the new technology, as Gisle and Fahami already have mentioned, is a big barrier. But also, even if we as a service bureau and a material expert are ready, they might not be because conventionally to get a new method and a new material, new product into these very hard and, and, and controlled standard takes a long time. So we need to work together, really, the end users and service providers to make this happen. Otherwise, it will take too long. Yeah, that sounds good. Collaboration and um, using the synergies then. Um, uh, Parsi, you, I mean, you told us you've been in the, this business for a long time and the development. Uh, I was thinking, I, I got one question here that relates to literature for super duplex stainless steels. How, how does that look today? Is it easy to find the publications and, and books on this or? Oh yeah, you have this, um, this conference proceedings and research reports and this duplex stainless steel conference that's held. And so, so there are, uh, I, I think for material scientists or for understanding the material and getting uh, data, it's really accessible. Yeah. Ah, yeah. That's good. Good right. to hear. So just uh, really, it sounds like you go out on Google, you write uh, super duplex stainless steels and that's it. tap enter, yeah, yeah. then you get it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we can contact Sandvik as well if you don't get the answer. Yeah, that's yeah. even better. Yeah, even yeah. better. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, and then also uh, we got uh, one question uh, related to um, uh, properties at elevated temperatures uh, and related to secondary phases. Um, I wonder, uh, maybe I could ask uh, Gisle about this. Do you have any reflections no, I, there? No, uh, I think it's like mentioned already, the typical, uh, typical temperature interval you use duplex and superduplex is uh, at sub-zero temperatures and up to about 300 uh, degrees centigrade. 
And that is because of, uh, of uh, 475 degree embrittlement in the ferrite phase at prolonged exposure at, at uh, higher temperatures than uh, 300 degrees. So if, if you, it stays for a very long time there, it uh, could get uh, embrittled in the ferrite yeah. phase. Yeah. That is, uh, I think Pasi could, <laughs> could answer it as, yeah. as well. Yeah. Please Pasi, fill in if you like to. Yeah, well, if you go above 300 degrees, you start to, things start to happen in the material long term. It's yeah. very slow processes, but if you go up to like 475 degrees, you get this spin of the decomposition of the ferrite phase uh -huh. after a long time. So, so you should really avoid being above, I would say, a certain temperature. It depends on the application, but roughly 300 degrees is uh, really to avoid being above that for a long, prolonged period. doesn't matter if it's a short time, no. but if you go up to 800 degrees and so on, you start to get these other phases in the uh -huh. material that you want to, okay. like sigma phase and so mm. on. Ah, yeah. okay. Interesting then. Uh, and um, um, let's see, um, I think it is uh, time for our last question here, That's because uh, time travels fast then. And, um, Let's see, uh, yeah, yeah, I think we, we have one then, uh, and that is um, related to all the uh, question for all the experts, uh, actually. Uh, Say this one for the last then, and, and um, uh, here it goes then. Uh, what do you see as the main challenge for the offshore segment uh, to overcome for implementing AM on a short time perspective, uh, in near time then? And uh, as we have Posse here in the studio, so I start with you, Posse, what, what do you say? Okay, I, I think one of the uh, important um, things is to get familiar with the material, get it qualified to your process and to make sure that you, you get, uh, are, are confident with the material properties. I think we can deliver the right quality, but you need to you, uh, pro be com comfortable in your own uh, process and your application. Yeah. Mm. Ah, thank you for that. And uh, you won, what do you think as a product manager? Well, I can just agree with Parsi and what Gisle and Farm has already said. It is the QA procedures. They need to be, you know, uh, comfortable with what we can deliver. Even if we are sure that we can deliver good results and everything, they've never seen or used these parts before uh, in, in the real life. So we need to overcome that and we can only do that together. Mm. Thank you. And uh, Nikhil, what do you say? Yes, I totally agree with Yuan and Pasi and also the parts that already has been discussed by Isla. But uh, apart from that, yes, the standards like this, like DNVGL that we, was mentioned and also the API standard that was mentioned by Martina, they need to be implemented more and also we need to have this more standard specific to additive manufacturing uh, because it might be a little bit different in terms of processing or maybe some test results as well. So it should be something tailored made for the additive manufacturing as well. Yeah. Uh -huh. And uh, Martina, what is your perspective on this? Yeah, I, I agree with all of them, of course. And I think that in all these sectors with a long time experience with most conventional manufacturing process, the really challenge, the very key is the uh, user truth in the new technology. So uh, in this case, the standardization and the uh, uh, quality control can help for sure to, to increase the use of this technology. So this is why we really need to have a standard, we really, really need to follow it and to assure the quality of the product to our customers. Okay, thank you for that. And Fami and Gisle, uh, I think you agree also that it is standardization and the quality assurance then that is in the scope here. And um, thank you very much for your perspectives here and, and your answers. Uh, but it brings good hope for the future. And Polina, now I leave definitely, it to you. Definitely. Thank you, guys. And uh, we are unfortunately running out of time, but that doesn't mean it all ends here. Because as promised, our experts will stay live for about an hour to chat with you and answer any questions that might still remain on this subject. So if you uh, head on over to additive.sanvik slash webinar, you can join the live chat and keep asking them questions. But for now, it is time to say my goodbyes, and I would like to thank all of our experts for taking part, and of, cor of course, all of you guys for joining in. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Take care, everyone, and stay safe. Goodbye. <laughs>